All right, you guys can hear me? Okay, so welcome back. Uh, it seems like it's like a post lunch uh, stupor might be affecting people, so I'll try to keep some entertainment value here. So I'm actually going to continue where I left off in the previous lecture, talking about one case study of an arms race between a host and a uh, viral pathogen in this case. If you recall, I uh, told you yesterday that K3L is an antagonist of PKR that's encoded by most pox viruses that uh, basically is a mimic of the substrate of PKR. So it, it presents an unusual challenge. And we think that some of these challenges have been uh, accommodated by PKR by virtue of its uh, rapid evolution. So today I'm actually going to tell you about the flip side of the story, which is uh, given that it is facing a PKR, which could be a life or death decision, how does the virus adapt um, in the face of this? And I just want to remind you, since I, I told you yesterday, uh, that this is all work that was done by Nels LD when he was in my lab. So uh, what Nels realized at the end of his first PKR study was that we had this very interesting system to study what would happen to, the, uh, to study the adaptation or the molecular mechanisms of adaptation of pox viruses. Now, this seems to be something that we take for granted because, after all, we know so much about viral evolution. But actually, the paradigm for viral evolution is quite uh, sort of influenced by very rapidly evolving viruses. And by that, I mean viruses that have a mutation rate or a nucleotide substitution rate that is far higher than most other life organisms, right? So, for instance, when we think about HIV or polio or even uh, uh, any sort of RNA virus that's worth its uh, name, essentially you're talking about nucleotide substitution rates that allow this virus to be able to adapt really quickly and therefore overcome any chemical or biological challenge. And these experiments have been done many, many times in the laboratory. So that's a really nice trade-off where they have a high mu or mutation rate and that high mu is somewhat sort of held in check because that also increases the potential that they're going to have progeny viruses that are carrying some sort of lethal mutation, right? So there's this trade-off between, um, and I think if Mike Lynch was here, he would tell you there's a trade-off between mu, which is the per base mutation rate, and the size of the genome. And effectively, this is what corrals the potential mutation rate of the virus. So the size of the genome of a virus is high. Mu cannot be high because the multiplication of this means that most of the progeny viruses would be carrying some sort of lethal or deleterious mutation. So typically viruses that are RNA viruses that have a high mutation rate actually have small genomes because they have to kind of uh, deal with this trade-off. Now pox viruses are at the other end of the spectrum. Unlike RNA viruses, which are typically less than 10 KB in size, pox viruses can be about 200 KB in size, right? So they are sort of at the edge of what you would even consider like a true virus. They're kind of like some of these giant viruses that have been discovered. So they cannot afford a mu that is anywhere close to what RNA viruses can actually afford. And yet, some of these uh, viruses are just as successful at jumping between species and being able to uh, essentially deal with completely new repertoires of immune systems. And so, we became very interested in the problem of how is it that these slowly evolving viruses, can they adapt so quickly? And so this became a really good kind of toy example for us to tackle this question. Um, I told you yesterday exclusively about K3L, which is a mimic and blocks PKR, uh, you know, phosphorylation of EIF2 alpha. But vaccinia virus and other pox viruses have actually another protein, which I didn't tell you about yesterday, called E3L. And E3L is actually one of those proteins that can hide and sequester double-stranded RNA to prevent PKR activation. So they have actually a two-pronged approach to deal with the PKR challenge. This makes sense because, after all, if these are all arms races, Vaccinia cannot actually rely on the fact that K3L will win the arms race against PKR. So they've kind of anticipated and gone after PKR in two ways. So in the laboratory, we can easily delete E3L, though, and put all of the evolutionary pressure on K3L. And in work that I told you yesterday, we had already described that the K3L gene from Vaccinia, which is a model pox virus which we can easily study in the laboratory, is ineffective against human PKR. It's very effective against mouse and hamster and gibbon PKR, but just by virtue of this binary 
switching back and forth, it's just not very good against human PKR. And we know that this is true because deleting E3L means that the virus fitness drops by three logs of magnitude, right? So that's a huge drop in fitness engineered completely by deletion of a single gene because the backup gene, K3L, happens to be not well adapted to the human gene. So why did we do this? We did this because we were effectively pulling the sort of elastic string back, moving the virus to a non-fit state, and then letting go to ask, how does the virus adapt now to this challenge? Because now it is faced with PKR. It has a kind of a poor K3L. How would it basically go about dealing with this challenge, right? So this is a kind of like how a lot of experimental evolution setups are, are done. They, you basically pose a significant fitness challenge in the laboratory. We do this, this is artificial, but partly we do this just to sort of accelerate the rate of adaptation that we might see, right? You're putting a greater selective coefficient. You have almost three logs of fitness to make up, and so you, it's more likely that you're going to see something in the laboratory. So how do we do this? Um, this is only describing because uh, how we do this can actually influence the uh, cadence at which these adaptive mutations appear. So the way we did this was not in liquid culture, but by plating vaccinia over HeLa cells as our proxy for human cells. And we do this at low multiplicity of infection. This is not a term that you've heard probably before. Multiplicity of infection simply is the ratio of pathogen to host. Right? And we do this at low multiplicity of infection because at high multiplicity of infection, you can actually have cheater viruses that are relying on other viruses in order to gain host entry. And we didn't want that. We wanted it to be exclusively a viral host arms race rather than a virus-virus arms race. And we did this in replicates, hoping that adaptation would occur. And then we could ask whether adaptation would be convergent, like the same mechanisms would occur over and over. And so every time this virus, we sort of scrape these viruses off from these plates. We kind of kept a aliquot of that in the minus 80 degree, and we moved them onto new plates, right? So the idea is you do this over and over, and if adaptation is occurring, suddenly you're going to see a lot more viruses and plaques forming in these HeLa cells. And so we actually did this about 10 times, which is over basically a summer or, or less than a summer. So we were prepared to do this for a lot longer, given that these are slowly evolving viruses. But actually, in just 10 replicates, uh, Nels presented a lab meeting that looked like this. So I just want to orient you. Here's virus titer now. This is not a proxy. This is actual viral fitness. This is the wild-type vaccinia virus that has basically not been perturbed. So it's very good because it has an E3L gene that's quite good at suppressing PKR. So when you delete the E3L gene, though, you basically drop from there to there. And so you are basically allowing the virus now to come up with a uh, solution. And quite amazingly, by passage six, they've already basically recovered most of the fitness that they lost, right? So this is like, uh, in a joke slide, you could sort of say, if you're an evolutionary biologist like I am, this is awesome news because obviously adaptation has occurred. If you're interested in epidemiology, this is very bad news because it took like less than six passages for the virus to evolve a workable solution to defeat the PKR, right? And this is just another way of showing that, that in fact, the starting virus has very, very low uh, fitness, and then these, all three replicates actually have very high fitness. So now we basically turn to the dark power of deep sequencing, right? That's when you don't actually have a really good hypothesis. We basically did some K3L sequencing, didn't see anything interesting. It's like, well, let's just, these are small genomes. We should be able to sequence this. And that just emphasizes how we have basically moved in the field of evolutionary genetics from this very hypothesis-driven approach to very discovery-based approach because it's become so easy to do experiments with, without even a very clear hypothesis about what to expect. And that's actually a clear shift that has happened just in the last four to five years because costs of sequences have basically plummeted to the point where, you know, you don't even need a fantastic hypothesis. So this is the Fox viral 200 KB genome that I'm showing you here. Uh, pox viruses are flanked by these internal, internal terminal repeats, which actually we don't deal with because they're so repetitive that with short read sequencing, we cannot actually infer what's going on. But when we looked in the entire genome, I hope you can appreciate, we basically had this sort of coverage map of short reads, which went like this, except at one point of the vaccinia genome, which was exactly coincident with the K3L gene, right? So now all of these replicates that had become adapted to be better at, at passage in human cells, 
had basically undergone an expansion and some of these, an average expansion of fourfold. And you'll appreciate from these sort of plots, these were not relying on some pre-existing mutation. This was in fact, each of these replicates underwent a new duplication, which is basically expanded up. And I'll describe what's actually going on in the next slide. What's really nice though, is that this is pretty, uh, you know, unique in a way because no other viruses had this very consistent change. We had a mutation in one of the replicates in the uh, polymerase, which also makes sense in hindsight, and then a synonymous site mutation in a protein which we already ruled out. So really all the action appears to be on the candidate gene that you would expect to be under selection to deal with the PKR challenge, right? Yeah. No, it's the same bin, right? So this is, this is exactly, we've just blown it up a little bit. The vertical axis is what you should pay attention to. This is just down to a single gene. In the zoomed in, it's almost touching five, but in the... Yeah, I think that mostly has to do with the pixelation intensity that is tolerated rather than with anything else. There's no, there's no difference in the data sets at all. Yeah. Uh, basically, what we have is a reference genome, and then we have all these short reads, and we simply pile up the short reads where they should map. And this is simply saying that over the K3L locus, we basically have four to five times reads mapping to the K3L locus than to an average site in the pox viral genome. Does that make sense? So just sequence, sequence is coming off the, so if you assume that the pox viral genomes that have gone into the sequencer, you're getting a read output which is a roughly proportional to the number of, uh, the amount of DNA relative to the particular loci. This is just saying that in each of these adapted strains, but not in the parental strain, the K3L locus has un undergone some sort of genomic expansion. And I'll show you a little bit more about what that is in a second. Any, any more questions? Okay. So uh, what's going on? So let's look at this a little bit more closely. Here we have the K3L gene. It's flanked by two genes called K2L and K4L. That's kind of like the nomenclature. But now we can basically probe, making like a radioactive probe against this gene to say, okay, what's actually going on here, right? What's going on in these replicates? And there what we see is quite interesting. So remember, this is one of those uh, uh, passages. We start with a delta E3L. It's basically a copy number of one, right? So you're cutting on either side of K3L. And as you go to passage four, you start to see the first inkling of some sort of duplication, right? So you're cutting on both sides. So you basically got this staggered ladder because you're not cutting equally. So you got like a one mer, a two mer, et cetera. That's the way to sort of interpret it. But, and that is really the rate limiting step. The initial duplication of the K3L gene is the stochastic thing that you need to act on. As soon as that occurs though, you have this rapid amplification where by passage 10, some of these viruses have undergone almost a 50 to 20 fold expansion, right? So the average is about four to five, but within them are viruses that have undergone almost a 10% expansion of their already very large genomes just dealing with K3L, right? That's the only kind of thing that's happening. Um, and so there are other examples where we have got breakpoints that uh, include more than K3L gene, but what this simply emphasizes is that the goal for each of these expansions in each of the three replicates was an expansion of the K3L locus. So once you have the original duplication, now basically unequal crossing over, which is a form of recombination, can act on in this accordion-like fashion, basically expand out the genome. But the initial duplication is the mutation event that selection needs to act on. And it cannot introduce the uh, mutation by itself. That has to arise spontaneously. Is that clear? It's, I, I'm sorry, you hid your mouth. What's going on in what? What is going on in simpler terms? Okay. In simpler terms, what's going on I'm gonna summarize this in a second, is you have a K3L locus, it's facing a huge PKR challenge that it cannot deal with, and at some low frequency, sometimes in the population, you have an original sort of duplication, right? So you've now increased the copy number by two, but what you've also done is provide fodder for recombination, and that can quickly go up to a copy number of 15, just by internal recombination. But you cannot increase by recombination 
with a copy number of one. You need, so this is a very slow step to go to 2x. This is a very fast step to go, you know, multiple x within that sense. That's right, because of exactly like you would think about nucleotide substitution errors, this is a DNA slippage error that arose at some low frequency in the population. Probably diminishingly small proportion of the population had this, but this is the one that basically had the selective advantage, and this became the progenitor of what was the successful virus. by deleting a different gene in the pathway, yeah. Well, if we delete K3L, there's no adaptation because there's no response, right? Okay, uh, here's the pathway. We've got uh, E3L that blocks PKR expansion, K3L that blocks PKR activity on EF to alpha, right? Both of them work. In human cells, this is the more important gene, and we've now deleted it. So we are left with a ineffective version of K3L, and we are asking selection to come up with a solution with this ineffective version. And this is the solution that uh, evolution has come up with. It's not doing what E3L would do. I'll explain what it's doing. It's just trying to do a better job of what K3L would do. And so I haven't told you what it's actually doing yet, uh, but I'll tell you in the next slide. But at this point, this is all we know, right? Like, so this is, is, you've got a copy number expansion of the K3L gene. There was a couple of other questions, yes. Yes, it will, and we are gonna cover that. So this is an expensive, inelegant solution, but it is the solution you need if you want to survive, right? So these are the selective pressures that we've imposed upon the virus. So think about a zoonosis where we have multiple instances, for instance, where monkeypox from African green monkey jumps into human beings, very different immune systems. And in some cases, that monkeypox is actually lethal. The reason is because it can rapidly replicate. But the actual transfer of the virus, were very few units of the virus was actually transferred in zoonosis, right? So it is basically in very small effective population sizes having to come up with a solution against the myriad of immune systems that it is facing that it has no experience with. And these are the types of solutions that it has to come up with even though they are inelegant, right? Okay, these are all great questions by the way. So what's the consequence of this, right? So the first consequence, which is not such a you know, profound thing, is you're making a lot more K3L, right? On average, you're making four to six times more K3L. So the solution is not that I come up with a great K3L version. The solution is I have a bad version. I'm just going to make a lot more of this version and overcome by mass action. Remember, this is a whole mass action game. This is a K on, K off game, right? So I can basically overcome thermodynamically by having this copy number expansion without actually coming up with a really great solution. Is that clear to everyone? Okay, and this is important because if you delete this with an siRNA specifically against K3L, uh, and as you can see this in the replicates, you basically drop the K3L levels, the viral fitness drops as well, back to the parent. So all of the gain in fitness that we see in the replicates can be completely explained because of the K3L expansion. This is now all done in human HeLa cells, right? But as the uh, previous question pointed out, this is a huge advantage to have this expansion in HeLa cells. Here are hamster cells. Now in hamster cells, a single copy of K3L is very good. And now in these cells, these replicates that have actually undergone this dramatic copy number expansion and genome size expansion are all unfit, right? So this just emphasizes that this is the cost you're willing to pay because the version of K3L you have is not well adapted. So, so, you know, the reason I bring up this example is we have this sort of perspective when we think about host virus interactions and red queens that these amazingly elegant solutions emerge. And I'll show you, they do emerge, but they go through these amazingly inelegant steps in order to do so, right? So this is a massive copy number expansion, quite expensive for the virus to do, and yet it does so because in that genome, it is facing a challenge that it cannot otherwise overcome. Yes. Uh, 
It is common in DNA viruses, yeah. It's actually common in everything except an RNA virus. That's right. Not only that, you can't actually deal with the cost because of this mu time G. So you can't really increase genome sizes given that your mutation rate is high, exactly, just to clarify. So what that means is that the vaccinia K3L, which cannot defeat human PKR, has to undergo this dramatic expansion. But because it can defeat hamster PKR, this expansion is actually now costly, right? So here's the same expansion that has different consequences depending on which host cell type you're in. So what's the final solution? Actually, it turns out that the final solution is we began to detect in later passages single amino acid mutations at one position in particular in two of the three replicates. And this was a mutation at uh, amino acid 47 where you went from a histidine to an arginine. It doesn't matter if you know. This is just a single amino acid change. Now, what's really cool about this is many years ago, in yeast, remember I showed you this yeast assay where PKR and K3L are fighting it out? We can basically come up with a K3L that can defeat human PKR by the same exact amino acid mutation. So which means the mutation spectrum available, simple mutation spectrum available to K3L, because this had been done at saturation, is actually one amino acid change. And these viruses basically arrived at that change via this adaptation, even though they did not have the luxury of these large effective sizes and these large sort of saturation mutagenesis, right? So essentially, you started off with a K3L that was not very good and ended up with a K3L that's very good. So what's actually going on here? So what we realized is that this expansion had a second advantage to the virus. Not only did it give the virus a transient temporary advantage, however inelegant against PKR, it now provided a lot more substrates for classical Darwinian mutation to act on. And one of those genes in this expanded accordion happened to hit upon the very residue it needed to stoichiometrically defeat PKR, right? And so that's what we can see as we go through passages. You can see mutations began to appear within the accordion. So what is basically going on is we've discovered that there is these sort of intermediate steps of viral adaptation. I want to emphasize here, this is adaptation that's strictly occurring through gain of function, right? For instance, if you're thinking about cancer genomes, this is an adaptation of a tumor suppressor gene, right? You're basically trying to evolve this, right? Versus an oncogene where a single particular mutation, you could basically get this loss of function, right? So loss of function mutation spectra and gain of function mutation spectra are completely different entities. And we try to conflate the two, but they're actually completely different uh, paradigms of mutation. So what happened here is you had this genome expansion that gave you a mass action inelegant solution. But within these, you began to basically uh, explore more mutational space, arriving at elegant solutions. And what's really kind of amazing is that once that solution arose, this accordion collapsed back down to just one copy because you did no longer had to pay the cost of this genomic expansion, you had a perfect elegant solution that you had arrived at. Now, you might be tempted to conclude that nothing interesting happened here. We were, in fact, for a long time. You went from this version to this version, separated by one amino acid mutation. But if you think about the mutation space you need to explore to arrive at just the perfect mutation, and given the population sizes of the viruses we were passaging, it's a diminishingly small probability that the virus would have basically arrived at that solution. It would probably have been killed off by PKR long before that. So what this emphasizes is that experiments like this, where we basically take uh, viruses through specific challenges and try to sort of explore the solutions are a good way to identify the intermediate steps that might be the actual true molecular signatures of adaptation. And this is something we see not just in pox viruses, we see this in plasmodia. Pretty much every anti-malarial drug that has acquired resistance, which is basically all of them, has gone through a copy number expansion. And we know that now in hindsight, because when we go back and look at the molecular mechanisms by which resistance evolves, it has always gone through a copy number expansion. And that's basically just emphasizing that the difference between getting a gain of function mutation is hard, and you have to go through this intermediate step. Mass action based plays a very important role in the initial steps of the adaptation, even though it's inelegant, and then you need to arrive at a more elegant solution. There's a question here, and then I'll come there. So we don't, that's a great question. I can't answer that. We know that it's less than six passages. 
but we don't really know how many generations of viral replication makes up one sort of plaque. That's controversial, but I would say if you wanted to get like a ballpark estimate, that's less than 600 generations of the virus. Well, so the initial accordion arose by passage six, and what I'm saying is that the initial uh, accordion that we could detect in the, in the laboratory is about 600 generations, right? So a good question that you must be thinking is like, how do you get this specificity? How do you get K3L specific duplication that you needed to start this process? And it actually turns out you do not. So by deep sequencing, what we realize is the pox viruses have their own mutation rate, but that involves this kind of DNA slippage errors. So many loci, in a, at low frequency undergo slippage error. That's a basically a way of exploring the mutational space necessary, but other loci are inconsequential and that they're basically lost, right? Or they collapse back down to one copy. But K3L, when the duplication occurred, provided an advantage as, as well as the fodder for this recombinational expansion, and that's what basically took over, right? So this is really important. This is stuff that has been seen in E. coli, salmonella, plasmodium, cancer genomes, yeast, gain of function mutations, Basically, there's no exceptions to what I'm telling you. All proceed through copy number expansions, every single one of them, right? Which means we really need to be thinking about copy number expansions as the sort of fodder for these kinds of adaptive gain of function mutations, right? It, it's important because I think there's not been enough modeling done, and I think some of you in the audience would be interested in that to sort of look at the spectrum of mutational space that's available for adaptation, and how do you seek out that mutational space in a manner that's not too expensive before you're driven to extinction. And so there are a lot of interesting sort of models to perform. You can have like a classic SR model, but you can also have more sophisticated models where you can basically uh, model for this. Yeah, uh, yeah. so uh, my question is, uh, when you have these multiple copies of K3L and this red uh, variant uh, emerges, uh, is it necessary that all the other copies get lost? I mean, I imagine that there's yeah, some so kind the, of... This is an experiment which I have not shown you. Yeah. So what we did was we engineered a version like this, and we put it back where we knew exactly what the copy number was, and we passaged it in human cells. And by the, the earliest we could resample the virus, the accordion had been lost. Which means it is actually very... So remember, think about this. This is an accordion that's not static, right? Like it's constantly sampling expansion and contraction which means you're constantly getting a histogram that's exploring both ends, high and low. If low is good enough and high is expensive, I mean, that's basically just dual selective pressures to eliminate the accordion. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, it goes through copy number expansion to defeat the host thing. So on the other side of the arms race, how do they adapt? Well, so that's what I showed you yesterday, right? I mean, they go through a, they, the question is, do like, most immune genes also go through copy number expansion? Right. And we almost certainly think that they do, just because we, most of them are present in multiple copies, although I'm going to show you an exception in just a, a couple of minutes. Okay. And, and are the time scales of, like, uh, especially with uh, virus, pox viruses or other class of viruses and the human genome, are the time scales of adaptation, let's say, let's say this adaptation happened in the K3L, uh, does the adaptation on the host side, does it take longer, smaller, does it depend on the virus? It takes orders of magnitude longer. But remember what I told you, this is a polynomial defense, right? Even if, uh, even if hu human hosts lose the PKR defense against pox viruses, literally 150 other options go after the virus. But for the virus, the stakes are really high because it needs to win each one of those battles, right? So this polynomiality is actually the basis for most defense in multicellular organisms, right? So Sally Otto, for instance, has done a lot of work showing that diploidy, you know, so the red queen in its original form was invoked, was basically invoke sex as being advantageous, even though every population geneticist would tell you that, that that's not true, and that's partly because of parasite pressure, right? It basically gives you an edge over adaptation and the number of combinations that you have. Yes? Uh, copy number expansion happened before um, uh, an advantageous mutation. Was yeah, that's an excellent question. Why could we not just go from here to red? I think it's just low probability. Uh, given that there are only there is only literally one amino acid mutation at one position that can give you gain of function, you just don't have the effect, the large population size of viruses present in the experiment 
or in zoonosis to arrive at that solution. You need to go through the solution where you artificially expand the substrate pool for those mutations to occur, and then you basically arrive at that substitution. So how does the copy number expansion happen? Well, the copy number expansion happens through this step, right? It basically is just an initial duplication that then leads to a, a dramatic expansion. So it's just a slippage error in a genome of virus. And, and so that's basically uh, enough to uh, give it an advantage because remember, even this expansion itself is an advantage, right? It is giving, overcoming PKR by mass action here. But this is a very expensive solution. So within this, you basically can acquire a secondary inexpensive solution which becomes fixed in the population. So there's two stages of adaptation. The first stage, which occurs very quickly and robustly, is the copy number expansion, simply because of probability, right? Because the copy number expansion can occur by, because of any duplication of the K3L locus. I, I don't really know how a duplication would occur. It's a DNA slippage error. So you think about it as, here's a piece of uh, DNA, here's a polymerase going through. At some low frequency, it's going to backtrack and basically duplicate this part of the genome twice. It's, it happens in every cell, including our own. There's a certain error rate at which DNA polymerases basically slip. In pox viruses, apparently they slip a little bit more, and that's perhaps because they've been selected for this kind of work. Does that answer your question? Uh, what causes the contraction? It's a recombination event. So no matter how big your recombination is, right? If you get a recombination between the terminal ends, this loops out and you're gone. So you can contract back from 15 to 1 in one step. I, I, I think you're not imagining the topology of this, right? So if recombination happens between these two terminal guys, you'll end up with one copy in the genome and a circle that has no hope of being transmitted of K3L that's basically being expunged. Yeah? Yes. So going from the first to the last is super rare. Yes, super improbable. Low probability. Low probability. Yes. Now, you say we go for genome expansion and we expect an increase, let's say 15 copies. Yes, it's a linear increase. And then at that point you expect a mutation, so I mean, they, they don't expect, remember, one of the passages, two of our three passages came up with a red solution. One of our passages did not come up with that. They only had a copy number expansion. So the copy number expansion is a robust, viable adaptation, right, to protect against PKR. Except in two out of the three cases, that expansion led to a more elegant solution company, and in one of them it didn't. So it's just, again, probability. In one of the passages, you didn't acquire the red mutation, and so you never basically contracted back down. Probability speaking, well, I'm, I'm thinking that you say this is very um, low probability, and then we now have three times that experiment, and now it's happening. So, like, probabilities don't match, it seems to me. Mutation rate uh, times substrate is the probability, right? In two out of the three experiments, the mutation rate time probability stochastically, mutation is not being introduced it's being introduced randomly, right? In two out of the three replicates, that random mutation was enough to introduce exactly the right mutation in the genome. And when it happened, this accordion collapsed back down. In one of the passages, stochastically, I mean, mutation is a stochastic process, you didn't acquire the right mutation, and so you stayed with the accordion. If we ran that experiment for a long time, we would expect all of them would converge to this elegant solution because you are providing a lot more time for that right mutation to occur. Yeah. Okay. Everybody good? Okay, we're going to switch gears now because I kind of want to come back to this concept of sort of using evolution as a guide to basically infer these specificity domains. So this is work that has been done previously in my lab. I'll tell you, I just want to sort of remind you again about the base premise of our uh, thesis here, which is that purifying selection maintains interaction interfaces where it's the best interest of both parties to maintain the interaction, and positive selection constantly reshapes the interaction interface when it's in the interest of one and not in the interest of the other, right? So that's a classic arms race. 
So question is, how successful is the strategy? Can we simply ask the question, where does positive selection occur to identify a host virus interaction interface where we have absolutely no biochemical understanding or worse, three decades of biochemistry have not been able to identify the interaction interface. So that's the story I kind of want to tell you about today. And that story is about another antiviral gene called MXA, uh, which is basically a dynamin, like how many of you have heard of the word dynamin? Okay, that's actually more than I anticipated. So dynamin is a really cool protein. It's involved in the cell biological process of endocytosis or transport in and out of the cell. MXA is a dynamin duplication, but this one specialized. It occurred only in vertebrates. It's specialized for immunity, right? So dynamin housekeeping, slowly evolving MXA, not housekeeping, immunity, rapidly evolving, exactly like PKR and PERC in that kind of dichotomy, right? So why is MXA so cool? Well, I think it's really cool because I study it, but mostly because a, a deletion of MXA renders mice completely susceptible to influenza, right? Deletion of just one gene means that these mice are going to be dead within four days of exposure to bird influenza or human influenza. But bringing back either human or mouse MXA confers complete protection. That's pretty rare that we can basically ascribe one gene with this property because it turns out that you can knock out all of those hundred genes with one uh, fell swoop, with one mutation, and yet recovering just with MXA gives you complete protection. So because it's such a dynamite influenza restrictor, people have been studying this for a very long time, and people have been trying to ask, why is it, and how is it interacting with influenza a very long time? And they have not really gotten anywhere because there's been complicated biophysics where these things have to oligomerize in just the right fashion, and mutation rate, mutations of these have been basically all loss of function. So where my lab got interested in it is because of work that coming out from a number of labs suggesting that MXA is very broadly acting. So even though it was discovered because of influenza activity, it actually turns out to basically go after every class of viruses that we know of, right? So it's a very, very broadly acting virus. So I'm trying to kind of frame this in a protein evolution sort of scape, even though this is a host virus story, just like PKR, because just like PKR, we, we are hoping to uh, derive some sort of general principles about protein evolution uh, that extend beyond MXA. So before I sort of get uh, too deep into MXA, I just want to point out one sort of dichotomy for those of you studying the immune system you have to grapple with, which is immune systems have to be one of two things. They either have to be broadly acting, but not specific, or they have to be specific, but not broadly acting. And that all immune systems and every system that you think about have this problem, right? Um, the few exceptions that I can point to are things like the CRISPR-Cas systems that are adaptive and can be broadly acting because uh, they're essentially not specific against one class of viruses. So PKR, for instance, broadly acting. Why? Because it recognizes double-stranded RNA, which is a feature of all viral infections. It's not specific. It's super efficient at being against, effective against broadly acting viruses, but it does so because it's recognizing a ubiquitous feature of viral infection. Another protein, it's not important that you remember all of these proteins, uh, but I just want to sort of emphasize there are other classes of host defenses, like this protein called tetherin. Tetherin actually tethers plasma membranes together, but they're actually host proteins that work on host membranes. So the virus has gone through its entire life cycle and is ready to leave the cell with all of these daughter viruses, but they can't leave the cell. They're daisy changed at the very last step of viral release because they're basically tetherin is anchoring them and basically preventing their release. And so, again, broadly acting for all enveloped viruses, including in Ebola and HIV. But why is it broadly acting? Because it's not recognizing, it's only recognizing the host plasma membrane. So here, classes of uh, these kinds of proteins, we see lots of positive selection, right? Just like what I showed you with PKR. But that positive selection has been driven by antagonists encoded by viruses to get rid of this defense, right? So in that case, the virus is on the offense to get rid of these proteins because that's how the virus is going to be successful. In contrast, we have viruses, such, uh, antivirals such as Trim5-alpha. Again, names are not important. They are really good. If those of you who came to the paleovirology lecture will remember Trim5-alpha, really effective, HIV, uh, excellent, but very specific, work only against retroviruses. Here again, we see positive selection, but this positive selection is all about reestablishment uh, 
of viral recognition. So viruses try to escape, Trim5 tries to reestablish, right? So we've got these two classes, one that's really broad but not specific, the other that's really specific but not broadly acting. MXA is actually unique because it's both specific and broadly acting. In fact, this is the only antiviral gene that we know of in all of biology that has solved this sort of apparent sort of uh, biophysical conundrum in a manner that we don't know. So in each case that it uh, uh, has antiviral activity, it binds a different antiviral protein. There's no homology between the epitopes being recognized, which would seem to be like an incredibly difficult problem, right? How does an antiviral gene simultaneously fight battles with multiple different viruses, and why would, why would it choose to do so? So this is the problem that we became interested in asking. I just want to tell you, if those of you are going to wait with bated breath, I'm not going to answer that. We, we don't know the answer, but we have sort of stumbled upon a couple of other different things that led us uh, in this territory. So once again, by this time, you're all experts in what we do. We start with sequencing. We sequence at depth so that we can slide a window one amino acid residue at a time. We get a really detailed picture of how selection has shaped MXA. Are there any questions, by the way, so far? Yeah? Okay. So this is actually work that was done by a graduate student in my lab, Patrick Mitchell, who collaborated with a student in the University of Freiburg. We both ended up working on MXA completely by happenstance, and so it turned out to be a really good collaboration. So actually, unlike PKR, MXA is quite slow to evolve. Right? So on average, 85% of the residues in MXA evolve just as slowly as dynamin. What that tells us is that the constraints acting on MXA for structure and folding are so severe that 85% of that protein has not tolerated any amino acid differences over 40 million years of evolution. So you might be tempted to conclude that this is actually a protein evolving under purifying selection. And in a whole gene average, that would be an accurate conclusion. And yet, in this milieu of otherwise constrained protein, you have these 11 amino acid positions that are evolving so rapidly that no two primate sequences have exactly the same residues at those positions, right? And we have like 25 of primate species now. So, which means that they're evolving under this diversifying selection dynamic. And in a crystal structure that had come out, we can see that these are not randomly distributed over the protein. They're concentrated in what we would refer to as hotspots of positive selection, right? So this is exactly in a cartoon version what we would predict if these were in fact interaction interfaces with multiple viruses. And one of the ones that I'm going to focus on today is this uh, unstructured loop called loop L4, okay? So what is the phenotypic readout? I showed you with PKR, the phenotypic readout was a yeast growth arrest assay. Here, unfortunately, we don't have something nearly as elegant, so we have to do actually viral infections. So what does that look like? So here's an empty vector control, which means we have a plasmid with no MXA. That's our 100% viral infection. Here's human MXA, which is very good at restricting this virus, which is an influenza relative called Togoto virus. Togoto virus is not a human pathogen, so which is why we can actually do a lot more experiments we, uh, with it than we can do with influenza. This is kind of like the choice that we've made because we want to learn about evolution here. And this is the same human version with a catalytic residue mutation in the GTPase domain. So the GTP activity and the oligomerization that ensues absolutely is essential for MXA's activity. So this is not something we discovered. This is like, this was already done. What we came in with was all the other primate cDNAs that we had cloned. And to our surprise, even though these proteins are like more than 95% identical to each other, most of them have no detectable activity against Togoto virus, right? So we've got this dramatic difference where it's actually quite rare to have human-like activity where you can lower viral fitness by virtue of MXA expression. So we, of course, became interested in why are some versions like human so good against Togoto virus, whereas other versions like African green monkey that's shown here is basically ineffective completely. I can really convince you of this dichotomy by doing this dose-dependent curve where we increase the amount of MXA that we express, and in each case, every increase leads to a further and further loss of viral fitness, right? So the more MXA you express, the, the more the viral fitness actually drops. And yet, at even very, very high levels of expression, African green monkey MXA is essentially crickets. Now, it's very important for me to emphasize to you that even though I'm not showing you this data, all of these are wild-type versions of MX. We've not like inadvertently 
uh, got some mutant versions because they're effective against other viruses. So this is really a specificity tuning difference, not like has activity or not activity, right? Against this virus, there's this dramatic difference. Night question. Uh, when the human studies are done in this uh, Thagodo virus, like, is the, the population against uh, whom you study, like, are they already vaccinated or, like, you know? We are not actually doing this experiment in humans. That would be almost like Nazi like. These, these are all being done in cell lines. So, so we don't have to worry about vaccinating cell lines, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. But I mean, this is effectively as in vitro as we can do and yet have like a robust viral fitness effect, right? Later on, I'll show you, we of course have to do this in animal models and we do do that, but it would be far too expensive and slow to do all of these studies in animal models to begin with, right? There's a question in the back, no? Yes? I just, yeah, it has antiviral activities against like many classes of viruses. That's you before, right? Right. So, yeah. Not just influenza. Oh. Not just influenza, yes. A question like that just occurred to me. Um, we, in all of this, in talking about the evolution of, um, of the immune system, um, there must be a transmission, right, between the, the parents are, is that, I mean, yeah, could you briefly tell how that happened? So, I'm, I confer. Yeah, so maybe, maybe you can hold on to that question for like one slide. And if I don't answer it, let's get back to that. Because I think, of course, this is all about Darwinian selection, right? Like, why do you have this kind of difference? But at this point, I think most of you should be thinking about, okay, what's the difference between these two near identical proteins that they have such dramatically different activities here, right? And so our biochemist friends suggested that, okay, we need to start making chimeras, et cetera, et cetera. And evolutionary biologists want to do like the minimum number of experiments that they need to get to the answer. So we decided to go after the hotspots of positive selection and starting with loop L4, which was the biggest hotspot we had. And so we basically uh, put in a human MXA backbone, the loop L4 residues from African green monkey at those rapidly evolving sites. They happen to be identical at two of the five residues. So we basically have now swapped in three amino acid mutations and you completely lose human-like restriction, right? Just by those three amino acids. And if you do the reverse experiment, you essentially confer almost complete gain of protection. So what this means is that even though in a traditional molecular biology setup, you would be completely obsessed with what has been conserved and retained in evolution, when it comes to arms races, it's actually the stuff that is the least conserved that is most important in terms of these determinant uh, of, of specificity, right? And so this is actually our very first clue or insight into what is the specificity interface of MXA against any virus. And this was not driven by because of a biochemical uh, constraint or activity. This was actually purely driven by an evolutionary hypothesis of very rapid evolution that is inferred to uh, occur at these host specificity determinants. So the experiment is we basically taken the loop L4 residues from African green monkey, put it into a human MX backbone. So this protein is 660 amino acids. And we've taken three amino acids from here and put it here. And in this uh, otherwise ineffective MXA, we put in three amino acids from human, right? And we basically can swap the specificity of the two guys. The conclusion that we uh, conclude is that uh, loop L4, which is this hotspot for rapid evolution, is in fact one of the specificity determinants that allows human MX to be so effective against Togoto virus and basically can confer that property onto other MX molecules, not just African human. Yeah. Any questions about that? Okay. Actually, things got even more interesting for us because one of those amino acids was sufficient to explain all of the differences, right? So here again is wild type human. These are now infections in uh, mouse and human cells. I'm just showing you human cells. So wild type human is very good at basically restricting or reducing the fitness of the Godo virus. And here's just what I'd like you to pay attention to. Here's a single amino acid residue change from a phenylalanine. I don't know how many of you remember 
from the lecture this morning. This is an aromatic hydrophobic residue to a simple uh, aromatic valine which exists in African green monkey and it basically loses the restriction almost entirely. African green monkey, which is naturally not very good, if you do the reverse amino acid change at loop L4, basically gains human-like protection. So here let's return to this idea of what is being transmitted to generations, right? Just keep in mind what, we, what I've just shown you is evidence of a single amino acid change that can completely change the stakes from the host losing to the host winning. So if you think about this happening in a population genetic setting where you're faced with a pathogenic virus, even a very rare allele at this particular position that confers gain of will basically go to fixation at the expense of all of the other wild type alleles in that population. So this is why the selective coefficients associated with these antiviral sort of immunity determinants are so high that we are basically able to successfully identify them because we have no idea what are the types of viruses that have plagued MXA over primate evolution. But it almost doesn't matter because it turns out that they've all basically chiseled away at the same protein determinants of MXA. And so we're basically even able to identify it working against Togoto virus, which is probably not the virus that drove the selection in the first place. Is that sort of clear? Okay, I usually get a lot of questions there or pushback. So I'm, either you guys are like totally that biryani was really good or <laughs> you, you've bought into the Kool-Aid. I don't know which it is. Okay, okay, I'm gonna keep going, assuming you're with me. Yeah. I'm gonna show you a structure in a second, yeah? So uh, we actually ended up doing what I was convinced an experiment that would not work. So remember, we are swapping between fairly closely related primate versions. We then went to mouse MX1. Now, Togoto virus is actually a, a pathogen of mice. So mouse MX1, uh, is not capable of uh, restricting Togoto virus. And yet when you bring in the human loop L4, you completely see this gain of function protection. So what is the biochemical consequence of this? This gain of function protection between MXA and Togoto virus is entirely mediated by its binding affinity to the target protein called nucleoprotein or NP. So for instance, human MXA in a co-immunoprecipitation experiment, which is simply, if you pull on human MXA, how much of the NP protein comes down with it as a binding affinity surrogate, you can see it's pretty good. Mouse MX1 is quite poor, but mouse MX1 with human L4 is actually even better than human MXA, right, in terms of its binding affinity. And this entirely correlates with an increase in binding affinity and an increase in restriction. So this is a little bit of a puzzle, and actually it puzzled us for a little while just to reconcile, because what we're really saying is the free energy of binding of the antiviral protein and its target protein can completely be this like Hill's coefficient, like switch-like state between the virus winning to the virus losing. But what I haven't told you is that MXA is an oligomer and so is the NP protein. So even though you have this monomer, monomer increase in binding affinity, you're basically multiplying it over the entire surface of the oligomer, and that's why you get this switch-like state. You're basically able to translate a small difference in the free energy of binding to a dramatic difference in the free energy of binding at the oligomeric state. And a lot of antiviral proteins work like this. They're basically able to work as oligomers, and I think, I suspect, a lot of this has to do with sort of reaping the full rewards of adaptive evolution of binding energy. Okay, any questions about that? Nucleoprotein, it's the protein that wraps around the RNA of the uh, virus. So it's effectively like the histone or the chromatin protein for the virus, yeah. Yes. That's right, so th this is actually the data for that graph. Here is mouse MX1 backbone with the uh, entire loop L4 from human MXA grafted into the mouse backbone. So we're basically just making like this Lego block-like swap where we bring in just that piece of the human MXA into the mouse backbone. The mouse backbone is ineffective, but when you bring in loop L4, you have both increase in binding energy, uh, I mean, increase binding affinity, as well as increase in restriction. So can you expand a bit about what, how is that happening? I mean, when you say that a part of human, uh, maybe. Yeah, so it's amino? essentially like uh, we, if you make an alignment, remember these are related proteins, right? 
So we've got over the length of the protein, human and mouse, you can completely align. And there's differences all throughout. Yep. So the question is, uh, what part of human, which is very good, can you put into mouse, which is very poor, to see a gain of function, like a human-like? And so what we decided was take the loop L4, which is the most rapidly evolving part, and when we do that, that's sufficient to give you the gain of function. So basically, it would be like switching the amino acids. Yeah, so, sorry, that, that's what it means. It's basically switching, in this case, the five amino acids, which are the rapidly evolving amino acids in loop L4. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I was not explicit about that. Is, is there some thought, did you guys, why is it, why is the response even more amplified than human uh, uh, MXA? We have no idea. I mean, it's entirely possible that something else in the mouse backbone is already good at enhancing the loop L4 activity. We have not mapped that. That's a pretty hard thing to map, actually. Yeah. Could it be that, okay, I'm just thinking weird ideas. Could something from mouse be grafted into humans? which amplifies MXA, human MXA even more. That's right. But th that's the experiment. This is actually a little bit of an overestimate of how different these are. These are quite similar in terms of the restricted potential. Um, but it comes down to genetic background effects, right? I mean, there's probably something in the mouse backbone that's actually slightly better. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this in a second as well. So there are probably other determinants, but loop L4 is the primary kind of specificity determinant. Okay. Everybody good with this? This is where I expected like you guys to like chime in and say this is like, you know, not true because we know better. Okay, so I just want to emphasize also, again, I think one of the things you take away from the schools like this is like, are there opportunities for you guys given the skills and the things that you're thinking about? And it's actually really a good and completely unsolved aspect to think about what's the value of oligomerization, which is rampant in the immune system. And actually, that's a great thing to model, right? That's way beyond my pay grade. But it's a great thing with, if you come in with a stat physics background or a biophysics background to model that. And I think uh, what's nice is that you can actually be able to get uh, experimental details that might be able to kind of match up to some of the things. For instance, we can make mutations, single or double mutations in MXA that prevent its oligomerization. So it can still fold up, still undergo the conformation change, turns out to lose out all of its activity against Togoda virus, but does work against other viruses. So we are able to kind of differentiate between, wow, we've really screwed up MXA structure to, wow, we've really screwed up MXA oligomerization, and that affects certain antiviral repertoires, right? So those are like opportunities to maybe spot for uh, things that you might decide to pick up on. So, yeah. That this study has been published? Yes, this is published. Yeah. Okay, so just to sort of emphasize, we are all back on the same page. What, what my goal for the first two lectures was to kind of emphasize to you that this evolutionary driven, uh, evolution guided kind of hypothesis generator is a really good way to overcome some challenges that we face when we're trying to look at host virus specificity determinants and exploiting the kind of principle that these should be rapidly evolving. We can actually like jumpstart our hypothesis. And I'll show you some other examples where this has actually worked. So I think Sanjay was asking me yesterday about what exactly is the kind of uh, landscape. And so, you know, just to like reiterate that we go from a codon model to identify residues that have recurrently evolved, likely because of completely different things, uh, different viral uh, challenges. But what we are hoping for is a convergent signature that even though we are testing against a present day virus, there would be a biochemical consequence, those changes that were driven by completely. There's absolutely no reason, I want to emphasize again, that that assumption would be true. But it actually turns out to be true, which is a very interesting thing, suggesting that the landscape of protein adaptation for many of these viruses is actually much more limited uh, than we tend to think about. And then we can get down to single amino acid residues that can completely change from the virus to the host winning, right? And ultimately, that's the challenge in terms of if you want to uh, come up with a better therapeutic against influenza, perhaps this is what you really want to do. What can you graft from a species that is really good against influenza onto a human equivalent protein, right? Okay, everybody good? Okay. So now what I'm telling you is actually unpublished. Uh, it's inspired by work that was part of this initial paper. And it's actually, in a way, I think about it as the sort of next kind of uh, step that we can take in thinking about how to exploit these evolutionary signatures. So I already showed you this experiment between human and African green monkey, 
where a single residue change at position 561 can confer this complete gain of function protection. Now, what I haven't told you, because I kind of wanted to get past this, but it is a little bit the kind of stuff you sweep under the carpet, is this is actually kind of bizarre. Why is it bizarre? Because residue 561 is surrounded, flanked by other residues that are also very rapidly evolving. And since we don't really know of a protein interaction interface that's one amino acid in length, this is unexpected, right? To, to find no interference between these neighboring residues onto the ability for a phenylalanine at 561 to confer a gain of function protection. And yet, that is what we find. So there are two possibilities. Either we got really lucky in the choice of species that we did, or natural selection has actually selected out those negative epistatic combinations of rapid evolution, and we have not sampled those because we were looking at natural versions of MXA. Does that make sense? So for instance, if you have rapid evolution, you know, you have two neighbors that are both going as fast as they can. At some point, somebody's going to crash, right? And the, the amazing thing is that we don't see those crashes, suggesting that those potential steric, uh, you know, hindrances or other interactions between neighboring residues that could be negative have already been selected out by natural selection. So that's, that's another hypothesis. Problem is that's like 40 million years of evolution and speculation. So how do we basically test that? So that's what Rosanna, who's a new student in the lab, decided to do. How do we study the sort of uh, negative epistasis of this particular domain in terms of its activity against Togoro virus? So here's, I'm going to take a small digression. I was hoping that uh, Lucy would cover this because this is really her specialty. And if she does cover it, just pretend that you didn't hear this, right? Like, listen to her, don't listen to me. But I need to, like, explain this to you. Um, just partly because this is something that is uh, very important in the way we do things. Yes. So, which might be in the uh, interacting interface. So, from a molecular basis, if one, I mean, it could be from hydrophobic interaction or otherwise. So, one uh, replace the amino acid with something more hydrophobic, for example, tryptophan. Will it increase uh, in work? I think I'll just preempt your question. So we yeah. can replace the phenylalanine with a tyrosine. That works. Yeah. The tryptophan, that works, although not so well. So these are the only three residues that work. Yeah. And these are also the three most biochemically similar to each other. I can say, though, that that is because of a hydrophobic interaction effect, even though these are aromatics, because we don't have a co-crystal structure or something that allows us to say that. But that is what we would suggest, yeah. Yes. And the yeah. fact that these three are... Yeah, but keep in mind that this is, I think the question that he asked is completely valid because what we are doing is a potentially artificial experiment where we are <laughs> changing it in the laboratory rather than looking at what has been tolerated in evolution. So it's a slightly different, you know, we are playing God here as far as this particular protein is concerned, which is, of course, not what natural selection is basically doing necessarily. Okay, so how many of you have heard the term deep mutational scanning? Okay, so deep mutational scanning is something that, is, especially the physicists in the audience, should be massively excited about, right? What is deep mutational scanning? Let's say you have a protein of length L amino acids. It is a facile approach to introduce every possible amino acid mutation at every position and test them all in one giant high throughput experiment. There have been about four to five dozen such experiments, including for antibiotic resistance like beta-lactamases, things like GFP, uh, essential proteins involved in, in other processes as well. And the process works really simply because it basically uses a PCR sort of uh, primer mutagenesis approach. And you can basically sample all of the mutational space necessary, right? So what are we talking about? 19 variants per uh, amino acid position times L. So this is, of course, a scales by linearity. So every single amino acid change in this position can be sampled. This is a rich man's version of something you may have heard about previously called alanine mutagenesis or alanine mutation scanning, where you basically replace everything with alanine. But of course, there's no a priori reason that that would be interesting because alanine could be similar to some of the existing residues here. 
you take the guesswork out and the, the scale of the experiment is done in one giant pot experiment. You, you generate this library by gene synthesis, you put it into cells, you assay all the variants simultaneously and you get a very good quantitative readout about protein function. If you are interested in the matrix of how sequence evolution affects protein function, you need to be deeply examining these data sets, which are, by the way, freely available, right? And, and more are being generated every day. This is actually the most high density data you could imagine to basically get to these protein structure function relationships, yeah? I'm not gonna tell you about DSM or deep mutational scanning because fundamentally there is a problem here, which is this works great if you're looking at single mutations. If you are interested in double mutations, you may still be able to get some sort of combinatorics, but then you can imagine for even like uh, proteins of modest size, the complexity just blows up in your face, right? In terms of the complexity that you basically need to sample like combinations of mutations. So we decided to do something completely different, which is we had already narrowed down the complexity of space we were interested in artificially to these five residues of loop L4, and so what we decided was like, how do you study this? How do you study the possibility of either negative or even potentially positive epistasis? And how do you basically decipher the rules necessary? For instance, is position 561 really critical? Or is that just something that came out of our, the few primate sequences that we had in our hand? So what Rosanna decided to do was basically do combinatorial mutagenesis of all of these five residues, right? So essentially focus more on the complexity of combinations rather than the sort of individual residues at high depth. Both of them give you a very important readout, right? Deep mutational scanning is the way you can look at constraints that preserve function. But this is the way you can look at uh, constraints in terms of diversification. So those are like slightly different goals. Is everybody on, uh, on the same page? Yeah from the previous evolutionary analysis that we did, yeah. From uh, DNA sequencing of primates, yes. Okay, everybody okay? Okay, so how do we do this? Well, we basically introduce these mutations by PCR. We select clones because we don't actually have a high throughput assay to do Tagoto virus uh, infections. We had to do them one by one. So she selected 836 clones. She had a number of wild types that were not mutated and she assayed them each for Togoto virus uh, replication activity. So this is kind of like what that data looks like. We've now assayed a whole bunch of basically identical wild type MXs. They're slightly different at synonymous sites. This is the range of activity of human MXA that's wild type. Here's the catalytically dead version of human MXA. You can see there's a good difference here, which is reassuring. And onto this, I'm going to graft all of the sequences of variants of MXA. And that's what that looks like. So this is a huge amount of work because this was not done in a one pot experiment, right? I, if, I, if we were smart and we had picked the right virus, we could have potentially done it all in one pot and that's what we are headed towards. But these were done one by one. Okay, so I'm gonna like make three sort of points here and I think I'm gonna still end on time, uh, which is good, unexpectedly. Um, which is, let's pay attention to this blue part first. These are all the guys, remember this was all done in a human MXA backbone. We've just randomized five residues of human MXA. These were all the guys that were just as good as human MXA. And one rule immediately pops out, which is the rule that you had already alluded to, that every restrictive version has to have one of these three hydrophobic aromatic residues. So that's a rule. You cannot restrict Togoto virus without having one of these rules. So that becomes a necessity function, right? Uh, and so, you know, there's no way to recover this rule unless you do the combinatorial experiment because you could always say if we just didn't have the right combinations, but now we really do have the sort of uh, massive combination experiment. It's not sufficient. Because if you look at these non-restrictors, there's actually no preference, including some of these non-restrictors have this position but they're non-restrictors, which means other, other residues in this loop L4, remember that's the only difference, have begun to interfere with the restrictive activity that would be conferred by having the right residue at 561. Remember, these were not things that we sampled in primate evolution, and that's what we inferred natural selection had gotten rid of, but because we've not relied on natural selection, we are able to recover these negative epistatic combinations that are basically missing 
from the record of MXA evolution, yeah? The rule is you have to have one of these residues, but that is not sufficient to give you restriction. So it's necessary to have these residues, but not sufficient to have these residues. Essentially, these five positions are basically random in terms of their preference. So, you know, non-restrictors have these residues, but they're still non-restrictors, which means uh, if you think about this in a, a loop L4 region, we have five residues. We think one of these residues is really important, residue 561, but, and it is necessary. All the versions that work have to have the right residues at position 561, but there are versions that have the right residue, but presumably because of these other residues interfering do not work, right? So having the right residue is necessary, but it's not sufficient. I hope that's clear, sir. Yeah. Yeah, but, but what, that, what that tells us is basically it gives us now variants that should work, but don't. And so now we can decipher the rules for negative epistasis, like what's missing, what's different between this and the natural record, right? Um, immunity is only, I mean, could be conferred by a single change because you're playing in that side. You know, you're kind of well, almost uh, there. Uh, in, the, in the African green monkey backbone, this was the only residue that was necessary and sufficient. I'll show you in a slide. That was because of the variant that we chose to confer activity to, but there are probably other determinants. And what this is saying is these other determinants in loop L4 can negatively interfere with the antiviral activity of MXA, even though you have the right residue. Right? So we haven't actually explored this in as much detail because as some of you have already been paying attention to, uh, our excitement was very high when we realized that in the combinatorial pool of 836 clones, we recovered four versions that were basically better than the wild type human MXA version that we started off with, right? So this is basically positive epistasis where we had basically come up with combinations of residues that were better than wild type human MXA. And wild type human MXA is the best natural MXA that we've detected out of like nearly 70 uh, mammalian MXs, right? Against Togoto virus. So of course, we call these super restrictors because you know everybody likes a superhero. So this is what that looks like in the dose response curve. Here's the catalytically dead version. Here's wild type human MXA. And then here's one of these super restrictors, one of the best ones we have, which at every dosage you can see is superior to human MXA in terms of its restric restrictive capacity against Togoto virus, right? So we are now, of course, very interested in what are the other residues, because some of these have the phenylalanine, which is what we expect, but what are the other residues that are basically necessary to increase the antiviral uh, potential here? So, so here's one of them that I showed you on the previous slide. This is, these are the residues in wild-type human MXA. These are the residues in the super restrictor. This is residue 561, so they both have a phenylalanine. Great, but they have four other changes, right? So this is where I bet Rosanna that you probably need multiple changes. Like one residue change is not going to be enough. That's the whole reason we did combinatorial mutagenesis. We should have just done DSM otherwise. And she said, no, it's probably going to be one residue. And so of course I lost the bet because she was right. Just one of these changes at residue 540 from a glycine to a leucine right here basically explains all of the difference, right? So even though we started anticipating that there's going to be like a complicated answer, the answer is pretty simple. Residue 540 has the potential to get even better against Togoto virus. It just hasn't in primate evolution, and we'll get into why we think that might be going on. These other residues don't matter. And moreover, it's not just leucine, but threonine, alanine, they're all better than glycine. Serine and uh, phenylalanine are equivalent, and proline is worse. You may have heard from the morning's lecture, proline is pretty much worse at every residue that's not proline. That's like a universal law, right, of, of protein structure. Yeah. Uh, are inconsequential for the gain of function. Yeah. Just yeah, sorry, I went through that really quickly. So here is the, uh, you know, 100% infection with the catalytically dead version. Here's wild type human MXA. Here's this uh, variant, the super restrictor that we found from our screen. Uh, 
And now we basically made each change one by one. So this is G4DL only. And you can see that's just as good as super restricted. And these are the other individual changes. And they are just as good as wild type human. It would be LFFSS, exactly. Thank you. And TFFSS and AFFSS are all just as good. But they did not destroy, right? So, and so there, there are many reasons for that, but we're going to get into some speculation in a second. Maybe Togoro virus, which is a mouse virus, is not you know, cause the selective pressure in the human MXA, but there could be other reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you are very astute. So the, this G uh, is basically a super restrictor in spite of the fact that it has a G. And so we are actually, we have not finished mapping but we've already ruled out single amino acid determinants here. So here, residue 540 cannot be the answer. So which means that some of these other residues are also contributing, and we are mapping that. So the question is, can we combine residue 540, 561, and one of these residues to make a super, super uh, restrictor? My colleague calls it super duper, that sounds cooler. The question is, can we combine them, or is there a limit to how much we can basically increase this? So those are the things we're doing exactly. The other thing we're doing, because we have not like gone very far here, is recognizing that basically this is a necessary rule. We are remaking this library, fixing it at phenylalanine, because we want to basically explore more super restrictors, right? So if we fix it at phenylalanine, now we will diminish the amount of non-restrictors we get, because they don't have the right residue at 561, and potentially increase the pool of super restrictors. So hopefully that's what we're basically going to see uh, coming on. because. Essentially, in our original screen, we had 836 clones, but only about 5% had any activity. And the reason it's 5% is because the others basically did not have the necessary residues at this position. So by remaking the library with the necessary residue, we are potentially increasing the pool of super restrictors. So do you have any idea about uh, the negative? I think he has a question. Uh, let, let him finish and then, yeah. That's what we infer because they have no increase in binding, if, uh, they have no increase in restriction against other viruses for which loop L4 is not the primary determinant. They're just the same. And similarly, these non-restrictors, amazingly, which are basically dead against Togoto virus, are just as good against other viruses such as VSV. So this, that's where the separation of function uh, is potentially coming in, which we are very interested in. Yes. So I was just asking about uh, the negative epistasis. Do you have any idea about which are those residues? Yeah, so we've not, I mean, it's, it's one grad student. So the question is, if you were faced with this, uh -huh. you know, of course, it's interesting, but like this is a super restrictor. So that's where she's going after yeah. is the gain of function. But she knows what those uh, non-restrictor sequences are. And so we're going to go back and look at them in more detail as well. Because presumably there are one or two amino acid mutations away from becoming a restrictor again. Uh -huh. No, I'm just thinking that instead of super duper, maybe it's just... Uh, those ones which are blocking the super ones. Yeah, so whether you think about these can get better because they're, they, you remove a negative remark, perhaps glycine is negative and this is, you know, those end up being the same thing. It's a net increase in function, exactly. Okay. So I think what this tells us is we have now a situation where we, by looking at the sort of loop L4, five residues that are like the alphabet for potentially diversifying selection, we can actually play with this alphabet, right? And not, we, we started playing with this alphabet because we wanted to understand the rules for negative epistasis, but we are excited about the possibility of positive epistasis, like gain of function existing, even in naturally occurring antiviral alleles. So we, of course, wanted to ask, okay, why don't we see this? So there's a number of reasons, right? Why, and, and this comes down to a little bit of... Uh, more like uh, what is your own bias about this. But what we already knew about loop L4 in an experiment that I didn't show you is residue 561 is not only essential against Togoto virus, it is also essential against influenza. Now, why haven't we heard about human MXA and influenza? Well, it turns out it's the, it's the activity that would only make a mother proud, right? This is a 50-fold restriction. This is on a good day. 
a fivefold restriction. You'd say, well, fivefold is pretty good. I would agree because human MXA has a fivefold restriction of influenza. No other primate has any restriction, right? So that is distinct and different because of residue 561. However, now we've gotten gain of function against Togoto virus by these super restrictors. Is it possible that we have gain of function against influenza? Then, you know, that, then that's where you start sort of thinking about pharmaceutical companies, et cetera. But sadly, what we actually identified was the opposite. So loop L4, which is the critical determinant for Togoto virus and can get better and better against Togoto virus, but every step where it gets better against Togoto virus, it actually gets worse against influenza. And I think that's actually telling us something really important because if you recall, I had told you that MX is this jack of all trades. It is working against a number of viruses. And because of that, I think it is now locked in this, again, like a PKR-like state where it has to be good enough against viruses. It can get better, but as soon as it gets super good against one virus, it actually loses activity against another. So this is actually the kind of fitness trade-offs we would not at all be able to uh, uncover if we were basically simply looking at natural variants because we have no combinatorial sort of power to do that. But by introducing the combinatorial mutagenesis, taking advantage of the fact that we only have five sites to worry about, we are basically uncovering some of these rules, which could be quite exciting uh, uh, to go after in the future. So of course, this is the problem that we are grappling with, which is how does it maintain antiviral breadth? So just, I'll give you like a five second uh, version of the answer which is for loop L4, which is the most important determinant for influenza and influenza relatives like Togoto virus. Uh, we've already done a lot of work here, but what I haven't shown you, and I'm going to run out of time before I do, is that we can replace all of these residues with alanine or with glycine, right, all five of these residues, and that has zero impact on MXA restriction of another RNA virus called VSV that we have in the laboratory. So MXA is really good against VSV, and it absolutely does not care what the loop L4 sequence is. We can't make a deletion of loop L4 because that screws with the structure, but the sequence of loop L4 does not matter. So that suggests that MXA is using this dynamin-like constrained architecture, kind of like the backbone of a CIS-RME knife, and it's grafted among these other potential uh, surfaces that are rapidly evolving interaction surfaces that combinatorially allow it to deal with multiple uh, other viruses. Now, I have to tell you, it makes no sense to me whatsoever why MXA would take on such a challenging protein engineering job, right? Other immunity genes duplicate and diversify, specialize. MXA has not done so, which suggests to me that there is a constraint that we have not really appreciated that prevents MXA from increasing in copy number, probably because of toxicity or perhaps because of interference of activity. Uh, and those are the kinds of things we'd like to get into in the next you know, few years. Yeah. Would that be different than like having just paralogs interfering? Well, if you had to, the, our thinking is that if you have duplicates of MXA that can basically oligomerize and mixed oligomers, you may think that that gets better, but it may also just get worse. And, and perhaps this is suggesting that it just gets worse. You're poisoning each other by virtue of your... Yeah, so that's a really interesting thing. Most mammals have only two MX proteins. And one works in the cytoplasm and one works in the nucleus. So you basically are exclusively homo-oligomeric homo by virtue of this thing. That again tells us that perhaps there's a cost. So we are artificially now taking the guy that's in the nucleus and moving it into the cytoplasm to see if it will actually interfere with function. Okay. So um, are there any questions? So just go back to the previous slide. So, uh, so far, I mean, among all the hotspots, you found L4 is the most dominant or well, most... we've tested it against one class of viruses, right, in yeah. detail. So, I, I'm just uh, curious, future work is testing so it against PSV, we other We know viruses. it's not L4, but we don't know what it is yet. So, that's the, the mapping is just started for that, yeah. Is there some gut feeling or intuition that for another class of viruses, it could be, another hotspot could be the... It could be a hotspot, but it, there's, it doesn't have to be a hotspot. Like, this is... This is the case where the hypothesis worked, but it could also be something where it's not like something that we detected under positive selection. Because remember in PKR, we had two guys, one's a hotspot and the other is not. So this could be very similar, like a toggling residue that is basically important. So 
the nice thing is that we have this assay and then we can, if we, if we strike out on the evolutionary sort of lazy do a few clones, we can always go back and do like more, the more intense mapping with biochemistry and chimeras. So that, so we're going to, we are setting up to do that right now. Uh, so since uh, uh, so since these are deployed cells, there would be two copies of MXA, right? So what happens if you're heterozygous for MXA? Does this dimer? Well, all adaptive mutation arises in heterozygosity, right? So the heterozygous guys cannot, by definition, interfere with each other. Otherwise, you'd see no adaptive evolution. The idea is that paralogs have different enough backbones that they basically now begin to interfere. But whereas heterozygosity arising only in just a few residues may not be sufficient make you uh, total speculation. No experiment has been done. Okay, so kind of what I just wanted you to leave with, because I'm not going to uh, talk about host virus interactions for my third lecture, is this idea of this very simple idea of where positive selection occurs um, as, a, as a guide to basically decipher these host virus interaction interfaces. And what's nice about this is that this has worked for nearly a dozen examples now in my lab and in other labs. Um, and it's, it has worked in spite of the fact that the antiviral genes all work through completely different mechanisms uh, and they work against completely different classes of viruses. But the one thing that they all have in common is this is really being driven by binding affinity games, right? And that is sufficient for you to come up with this high precision hypothesis generation of what is actually the specificity determinant. It also tells us something quite cool, I think, about susceptibility determinants in general. This entire field that, you know, I belong to is obsessed and rightfully so with why are some species completely impervious to viruses, whereas very closely related species are highly susceptible. And we used to think in the pre-sequencing age, this is because our immune repertoires are very different. Actually turns out we've had the sequences now so we can reject that hypothesis. Our immune repertoires are very similar, but each of our immune repertoires has been tuned to different specificities. And what's really nice is by learning these tuning determinants, we can, for instance, put rhesus trim 5, one amino acid, into human trim 5 and have a bona fide, really awesome HIV restrictor. And those are the kinds of things that sort of motivate this, both to understand the basic biology of these interactions, but also to come up with versions based on what has been uh, identified um, in our primate relatives. And so if you're interested in this kind of thinking or work, you'd like to read more because there's a lot more vignettes. I'd encourage you to read this review. I did not assign this review because I felt like one review is good enough for a reading. Um, but if, if you're in, I, I can certainly send this. This is designed to a novice reader. Uh, we were told kind of early undergraduate uh, in annual reviews of genetics and goes through the pretty much all the slides that I showed you except the combinatorial mutagenesis. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. All right, thanks. I am mostly fascinated by cancer. So I was just curious, uh, have, you, have you or others at Fred Hutch uh, looked at uh, applications of the, the specific, uh, you know, to cancer? Uh, well, in theory, you could. I think like, one like, of the problems yeah. with looking at positive selection in cancer is that the evolutionary time scale is very shallow. So it's effectively like doing this kind of DNDS type analysis in a chimp human or a Neanderthal human. You'll get signal, but because, you know, DS is like stochastically changing so much, you don't really know whether that signal is accurate as a readout of selective constraint. Now, that has not stopped people from doing this kind of analysis, but that doesn't necessarily mean that what they came up with was actually useful. So uh, those are the kinds of like things that make me nervous. Now, whether we can use this inside of copy number expansion, I mean, other people have detected that also, right? And that is certainly, so the cancer cells, one of the signatures that people don't focus on is they have an entirely different metabolism, right? They're living in hypoxia. They're basically able to kind of feed on sugar. They can completely dispense with their mitochondrial function. So they actually have to completely remodel their metabolism. And that is entirely being done by copy number changes, right? And actually Mukun Tatai, who's at NCBS, has done a lot of work on like looking at those kinds of uh, copy number changes in, in a previous incarnation of his uh, scientific career. Oh, people have they discovered? No, in fact, actually it turns out, 
that the other feature of cancer cells, which is being used therapeutically, is they have almost completely ablated or defanged their antiviral response uh, interferon. We don't know why that is, but it is universally true, which means a, a benign virus to us in a normal cell like VSV, which we are, each of our cells can like awesomely get rid of, right? Cancer cells are killed off by that. So this has led to this uh, field called oncolytic viruses, where they take completely benign viruses like herpes viruses, pox viruses, et cetera. Myxoma virus, which comes from rabbits, is one of these wonderful oncolytics where myxoma virus is completely harmless unless you're a rabbit, right? Like if you're a human being, uh, you're completely like, you have nothing to worry about with myxoma virus. But if you're a human cancer cell, you have like 100% death rate. Uh, within minutes of a myxoma infection. And that's because it is basically incapable of mounting a proper antiviral response. So that has been exploited by people. So, But there is not an immunity gene that is a specific signature of cancer cells. It's mostly the dearth of immunity that's the signature there. Yeah, um, I want to find out um, from one of your statements that if you have a single mutation in a locus that um, gives rise to uh, gain of function, then it goes to fixation, you know, very quickly. Um, will that be the case with anti-malaria drug resistance? Because yes. um, like in currently in Southeast Asia, some parts of Southeast Asia, there is resistant development of resistance to the atimicinin-based uh, drugs. So will it mean that it will be a matter of time before that spreads to other parts. Absolutely. It's an inevitable thing. As soon as resistance is detected in a well-mixed population, epidemiologists are already anticipating that this medicine that they've spent millions of dollars producing is going to lose efficacy. Uh, in malaria, it's actually even more significant because the, the amount of time it takes for the medicine to lose effectiveness is usually two seasons. So two years, you go from like really good to, yeah, might as well not waste our time and money. That's because like the spread is, of course, vector-borne, and so you basically have this dramatic spread of uh, things. But what's really cool about the malaria, and to, including the Artemis and resistances, what they see is actually this copy number mediated gain of function, the cytochrome P450, which is sort of a universal thing. And it's exactly the same class of genes that is also beginning to be detected now in African populations with, with, the, with the plasmodium as well. So it's almost as if two different populations, and it's controversial whether that's because of migration or independence, but in two different populations, the same solution has emerged uh, by, via these copy number expansions, exactly. Now, what I would say is that this resistance is expensive, which means that it's not that the malaria parasite is not paying a penalty to acquire this resistance, but in the face of the treatment, it is, of, of course, beneficial, but if you remove the treatment, this becomes an expensive thing. So some people have speculated that going through cycles of treatment and withdrawal and cycles of treatment and withdrawal might be a way to keep a balance between the protective and the non-protective alleles. Because in the face of the treatment, the protective allele is beneficial, but in the, when you withdraw the treatment, it's actually detrimental. So it may actually bounce back and forth between that. And that's also been speculated for cancer chemotherapy as well. Amino acid at a very distant site from the site of uh, amino acids that is under positive selection is contributing to the force of each selection. Yes. I mean the, uh, the uh, whether the cellular uh, sorry the 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 context of the protein and the distance matters, right? Yeah. Certainly it does. What I you know I didn't actually spend any time on that, but in a three-dimensional structure of protein, you could have amino acids that are very distant and primary sequence, but they're actually directly interacting in three-dimensional space. Exactly. So we, we, we know that those contact residues, we call them, uh, are, are definitely co-evolving with each other. And I think you're going to hear tomorrow from Lucy how we can use patterns of co-variation within the same protein to actually infer these structural states as well. So, uh, so that's more of her department. Whether that's actually constraining positive selection, we don't know because we've not done any work towards that, but whether they're influencing rates of evolution, I would be very strongly surprised if they're not. Okay. Then another thing is, um, the, suppose I detect a particular uh, amino acid that is under uh, uh, 
select, um, positive selection using uh, maybe blast as you said and then how can i uh, where will i start You'll from some i mean assay. no after as in generating the particular uh, making the vet, the mutant the mutations and putting them the techniques and maybe sort of confused maybe <laughs> i want to well know. i mean so either you have to do it yourself or you collaborate with somebody who can test some of your predictions in the laboratory right the the, the goal is if you go to a vet lab biologist and you say well, here's this protein that I'm really interested in. Uh, I'd like to work with you and like figure it out. And he's going to say, yeah, well, like, see you later. But if you go to him and say, I'd like to test like these four mutant versions in this assay that's already well established, he may say, well, that, that's great. Let's do it, right? Because what, what, what positive selection, these kinds of analysis, what they're doing in a way, practically speaking, is they're kind of constraining the search space that you need with just a few residues. Now, that doesn't mean that the other residues are not important, right? I want to be very clear. But what it certainly improves is the search space that within those positively selected residues, you're probably going to get some phenotypic difference, which is something you can follow up on. Oh, thank you.